wonderful. I do show noon, so we'll get started here. I know folks may still be uh, joining us, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started, and they can ease on in. So hello and good afternoon. My name is Susan Proctor, and I am pleased to be uh, serving as the third full-time director of alumni relations for Grand Valley State University. So uh, pleased to ha have you as part of our Retire Well program, uh, the first session on Medicare today. So uh, a little bit about me and how this program became to be. So I started in this position about a year ago. And while I am new to this role, I am not new to the university uh, nor to alumni relations. So like many of you, I attended um, Grand Valley in sort of another era. So I started in the 90s uh, while Grand Valley was still a young and fledgling and growing uh, institution, which continues to grow and evolve. And so I had the opportunity to come on board to alumni relations or back on board. I had served um, in another capacity in alumni relations for about five years before serving as a career educator for the last decade and returning. Uh, but I think I returned in at a time where we realized that along with our university, our alumni population was growing and evolving as well. So many of you that were uh, students as the first few decades of Grand Valley's history and we're really the bedrock that we grew up on are also uh, growing and evolving into new places in your life. And our commitment in alumni relations is to continue to serve and support you throughout every stage of your life and career journey. And so part of that is ensuring that you are being prepared um, to move into and prepare for um, moving into and through retirement in a good way. So uh, was pleased to partner with Melissa, who I will introduce in a moment here um, as part of our alumni board of directors um, in offering this five part series of webinars called Retire Well. So today's session is Medicare 101 and we have another um, guests joining us today. So thank you, Mike, for sharing uh, great information. And then we uh, will be meeting every week at this time of coming on webinars. Um, and you can see that schedule here if you have not signed up or are interested in joining those future um, sessions, you can do so at the web address listed here or just by putting your camera over that little QR code. Um, we will also send some follow up materials and you can register from there. So lots of great programming to come here. Um, and without further ado, I did want to introduce our next speaker, Melissa Stewart, who graduated in 2009, and I know we'll talk a little bit more about her background. So Melissa, let me turn the screen over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Susan, and thank you, Grand Valley State University, for giving us this opportunity to present today. As I think about when I graduated in 2009 and more recently, Grand Valley's campaign saying Laker for a Lifetime, you started you know, prior to your career, most likely at Grand Valley State University. Um, and now as you round out your career and you start thinking about retirement, what a cool way to help be able to support Lakers along this transition and really have it be part of Laker for a lifetime and being there to support other fellow Lakers and just the uh, community as a whole. So I think that's really cool. Um, it would, I'm going to start sharing my screen with you here real quick here. So let me get set up with that. Um, let's see, did I share the right screen? Did it come on? Yes. It doesn't show. Hold on just one second. Share that screen. Share. All right. Hopefully you can see it. It's not highlighting in green like it's supposed to for me usually. You see it? Yep, okay. it's up. Thank you. Uh, it wouldn't be a financial presentation or an educational presentation without my compliance team nicely reminding me that I got to make sure I throw our disclosures out there. So, um, but while you have a chance to read those disclosures, please don't fall asleep at the beginning of the presentation. A um, little bit about myself. I started um, at Grand Valley in 2009 while I was going to school at night, working locally at Lake Michigan Credit Union. Um, so I finished, I'm sorry, I finished my degree in 2009 with a major in business management and finance. Originally, I thought I would be going to med school when it came to my path in life. But as I started school and worked at Lake Michigan Credit Union to help pay my way through college, I quickly found out that I had a, I had a passion for finance. So now I get to help people with their wealth rather than their health. But interestingly enough, your health 
um, really it impacts your financial plan, right? The health insurance plan you choose, whether you're maximizing the contributions to your health savings account, the Medicare plan that you choose will all affect your financial plan. It's part of risk management when it comes over to your overall financial plan. And in risk management, we wanna make sure you have the appropriate coverage in place for when things do come up to help you uh, pay for them. And so that's where Mike at Benefit Insights really comes into play when we talk about Medicare and informing you and helping you make sure that you have the right coverage. Also a part of your financial plan. So Clear Vista Advisors uses a financial planning program. It's called Money Guide Pro. It's one of the top financial planning softwares out there. And the first thing we do is talk to you, what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s, and then as you get closer to retirement? And as you'll notice here, we, we have many goals, but here I have a plan for Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And as you see here, one of the things that we are budging for is healthcare and retirement. Mr. and Mrs. Smith are in their early 60s. They've saved about $600,000 over their careers for retirement. And now we have to budget for the fact that they have to pay for healthcare, Medicare, and retirement. And so we work with them and their Medicare agent to help them figure out what's the right plan for them. And then we budget for it accordingly. Most people are shocked to see that for full-blown Medicare, you could be spending on a pocket about $10,000 a year, potentially. We need to budget for that in your financial plan. In addition to that, one of the assumptions we use is we know healthcare is growing at a faster pace. Now, well, we won't get into a debate about inflation today, but over the past 20 years, we've seen healthcare expenses go up about five to 6% a year versus the, your other goods, groceries, gas, uh, other expenses in retirement. Historically, we've seen those go up about two to 3% a year. So we need to budget for that separately and differently. So just wanted to let you know that if you're not talking to your financial advisor about Medicare, about how they're including this in your financial plan, um, your cash flows when it comes into retirement, it's something that you want to take into account. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton over to Mike. But prior to that, I want to talk to you a little bit about Mike's background. So interesting in life. Mike graduated from Ferris State University. We won't hold that against you on today's presentation, Mike. All right, all right. My, my all wife's right. a Laker. My wife's yeah. a Laker. Um, but <laughs> one of the two people. is a smart one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but helping others has always been in Mike's DNA. He graduated with a degree in criminal justice. Then he moved on to work for many, uh, a couple different nonprofits here in the Grand Rapids area in West Michigan. And after that, he wanted to continue to help people, but he found a calling in helping people over the past few years and helping others figure out what's the appropriate Medicare plan for them. Um, Mike and I have been partnering now for a couple years, and um, I've had many uh, clients of, my, of mine uh, go to Mike, and he's helped them immensely try to figure out Medicare. I call Medicare alphabet soup. You have part A, yeah. you have part B, you have part D supplementals, maybe you get a G plan, there's all, it's alphabet soup. And Mike helps you digest that uh, letter by letter. And he's going to yeah. go into that information today. So when Mike is not uh, busy uh, running his company and helping others choose their Medicare plan, he is at home with his 10 month old. So Mike's still a little sleep deprived at this point. A little bit, a little bit. 10 month old daughter, um, yeah. Maddie. So with that, Mike, I'll go ahead and turn the baton over to you. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm Let sorry. I forgot to talk about Zoom etiquette. So today, I'm sorry, Mike, real quick. No, no, it's okay. Today, we uh, are going to be answering questions as you go along. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A area. We really want today to be interactive. We want you to get the most out of this as possible. So down at the bottom of your screen, as you have questions, put them in the Q&A area. I will moderate those. I'll ask questions that I commonly hear my clients ask as well. And the more questions, the better so that we can make the most out of today's session. The session is being recorded. There will be a link to it. So if you don't catch everything today, uh, please know that you will have a chance to listen to it again after today's session. 
And with that, Mike, I will go ahead and turn awesome. this on over to you. Thank you. I will go ahead and try to get the screen share going here real quick. Okay, is that working? It is. Okay, perfect, perfect. So everyone, thank you uh, for, for attending today. And, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with everyone today about Medicare. Um, like I said, my, my name is Mike McIntyre. I'm an independent insurance broker here in Grand Rapids. Uh, I've been helping people navigate this, this, this Medicare maze, if you will, for uh, a little over three years now um, and, and working with Melissa in the process to do so. Um, you know, as Melissa stated, uh, you know, Medicare, when it comes to your financial planning, especially in retirement, is a very vital piece of the puzzle uh, as, as healthcare costs are actually the third highest, uh, um, you know, annual expense for Americans. Um, you know, behind things like uh, rent and, and child care, believe it or not, but, but, but uh, you know, health, health insurance costs are obviously very costly. So what I want to do today is, is go through what I call or consider a Medicare 101. This is a, this is a um, you know, educational event. Um, so we're not going to get into today, you know, specific carriers or plans or products or any of that kind of stuff. This is not by any means a, a sales pitch. This is a educational event today that, that hoping to um, lead you and guide you down some of this Medicare uh, uh you know, alphabet soup, as Melissa called it. So um, I understand that everybody is in, in their own Medicare journey at different times. I, I assume there are people here joining us today that might not be eligible for Medicare yet, uh, have, haven't crossed over into that 65-year-old uh, market yet. Uh, I also assume there are people here who are probably already on and enrolled in Medicare. So, you know, this this presentation is going to cover a little bit of both sides of, of the coin for people, uh, you know, either, either pre-Medicare enrollment or after. So um, I hope that you guys learned something today. As, as we go through this and then obviously go ahead and ask uh, Melissa, there's the Q&A section there. If you have any questions, she'll be sure to get that to me. But uh, Melissa can attest, once I start talking about Medicare, uh, I, I can go for quite some time and I know we're limited today. So I wanna get started on this and, and try to get through as much of this as we can. So a, a lot of the topics that I want to take us through today are, are going to include things like original Medicare, understanding the, the, the components of the federal government provided original Medicare, uh, including parts A and B. Uh, I do want to talk a lot about the costs associated with those and how those function, as I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there about that. So that's going to be a, a vital piece. Um, then I jump into talking about prescription drug policies. And I, and I honestly, I put, that, I put that towards the beginning of the presentation, because when I, when I deal with folks in, in their Medicare um, needs one of the one of the biggest areas that I find people either saving themselves a bunch of money if they're if they're doing you know making the right changes and moves or or unfortunately costing themselves a, a lot of money is in the areas of prescription drugs. Um, you know there are a lot of changes that are coming to Medicare prescription drug plans here in the next handful of years, uh, but but as of today, 2023, we're still dealing with some of the some of the pitfalls that Medicare has when it comes to drug coverage. So I think that's important to understand where that where that comes into play. And then you know obviously like Melissa said we want to make sure that we are budgeting for Medicare and understanding where our costs are going to come from. And, and you know, there's really a couple different ways of doing this. And, and, you know, what we want to do is we want to fill in the gaps and the holes that original Medicare presents. And, and we're going to talk about those here in a minute. But the two ways that we're going to be able to do that traditionally is either with what we call a Medicare supplement, also known as a Medigap policy, uh, or also Medicare Advantage or Part C plans, which have, which have been gaining massive traction and uh, uh, popularity over the years. I'm, I'm sure you've seen the commercials on TV. Um, so we will uh, we will dive into all these things here now. So uh, when we talk about the original parts of Medicare, right, what is what is provided by the federal government? It's really only talking about part A and part B. OK, so part A is what we consider your hospital insurance. Now, there's a big misconception about this. Unfortunately, people think that if they're in the hospital and they have Medicare part A, well, you know, one plus one is two in this situation. And and that's that's unfortunately not always the case, because when you talk about Medicare part A or hospital insurance, we are more or less talking about the room and board associated with that stay. OK, um, that, you know, things that, you know, inpatient care in a hospital, skilled nursing facilities, hospice care, home health care. You know, the one thing that those things all have in common is the word confinement, right? When you are confined to a location, that's typically when part A is going to kick into play, but it's not going to be the medical services that are provided to you during that stay necessarily. And that's, and that's where A has, has some, has, you know, falls short. Uh, but that's where Medicare part B comes into play. Okay. Medical part B, uh, I'm sorry, Medicare part B is the medical insurance portion. Now we're getting coverage and, and help to cover things from doctors and, and providers, outpatient care, uh, a lot of the durable medical equipment type things, wheelchairs, 
walkers, uh, a lot of the preventative services, you know, a lot of your routine provider um, services, uh, cancer screenings and tests and procedures and, um, you know, those those type of things are going to get covered under B. So the meat and potatoes of original Medicare is, is really is really part B. Now, I do throw part D on this page as well. Now, as well, it's not included in original Medicare, but I put it on here because we'll find out as we go through this that without Medicare Part D at a absolute minimum, um, there is actually penalties involved with not having Part D. And, and, and unfortunately, I actually, I met with somebody last week who, a uh, husband and wife who have spent now 10 years on Medicare without prescription drug coverage. And they realize how quickly now that penalty is going to affect them. So I put that on this slide only because when we talk about Medicare at an absolute minimum, regardless of uh, supplement policies or advantage policies, A, B, and D are the ones that you're going to need to get yourself by at least at a minimum. Okay. Now, when we start to talk about a little uh, original Medicare a little bit further, right? Original Medicare is what's being provided by the federal government through the Social Security Administration. And again, we said that is part A and part B. OK, that includes that hospital and doctor that doctor coverage. Now, fortunately, the nice thing about original Medicare is that it is going to be covered by any hospital or doctor in the country that accepts original Medicare. OK, so when we when we talk about travel aspects and around, around Medicare, um, you know, original Medicare does a good job of that because, you know, it's accepted anywhere in the country as long as, you know, as long as you're uh, seeking a, a original Medicare acceptor, uh, which, you know, 99 percent of doctors and hospitals are. So um, original Medicare, what's nice about that is that you show up kind of where you want, when you want to see who you want uh, and, and you're not limited by any sort of doctor networks or anything like that. So that's the one good thing that I'll give original Medicare. Um, now, when it comes to Medicare Part A, most folks are not going to have to pay a premium for that, right? As long as you have paid into to FICA, Federal Insurance Contributions Act tax, and, and worked for 10 years in this court in this country, then you've already paid for, bought, and earned your Part A of Medicare. So that, that counts for both a, a you and a spouse. If one spouse has those 40 quarter credits and the other does not, it still counts for that other person as well. But Part A, typically not going to see a premium for in most cases. Now, that is not the case for Medicare Part B. OK, uh, everybody has to pay Medicare Part B. There is only one exception for people who don't pay that, and that is people who are on state assistance Medicaid. Right. So if you are on low income, low asset state assistance through, through Medicaid, through the state of Michigan, those folks sometimes have the ability to get their Part B premium paid for. But outside of that, everybody else is on the hook for Part B. So think of Medicare Part B as your ticket to the dance, if you will. Right. Before we can sign up for supplement policies or advantage plans or any of those things that fill in those gaps and holes you have to have original Medicare Part B. Now, that, that, that cost is different for everybody. And we're going to explain that here in the next couple of slides and going into detail of what those costs are. Now, the premium, again, is just what you have to pay on a monthly basis just to have original Medicare Part B. But after that, you are still going to be on the hook for a portion of your services. Uh, and those are going to come in the ways of things like deductibles and coinsurance. OK, and we're going to break that down here in the next couple slides as well. Now, the new the, the, the two most important things that everybody needs to understand about original Medicare A and B and, and how and why I recommend wholeheartedly that you just cannot stay on original Medicare only. And this is it's for these two facts here. Original Medicare does not have a max out of pocket. There is no cap. There is no limit to original Medicare costs. And unfortunately, like I said, my, my example last week, they, they, they found that out the hard way. They were on original Medicare uh, and there is no cap or, or max. So uh, they are paying a portion of, of every dollar that was spent um, during, during his nine day hospital stay. Uh, and, and that is, is obviously, uh, um, you know, Quite a quite a big expense for people that that are on original Medicare only. So that's our first problem, right? Uh, and then our second problem is the fact that original Medicare is missing things like dental, vision, hearing, drug coverage. You know, all those extra components that that are really important to to be uh, you know covered as well as you possibly can. So. Bottom line is with this, guys, there's original Medicare on its own. It's missing a lot of components. There are a lot of gaps and holes, and we need to find ways to fill in those gaps and holes and reduce those costs as much as possible. So when we start talking about these costs now, okay, let's talk about original Medicare Part B to begin with. Like I said, Part A, there is no premium, but Part B, everybody's on the hook for. Now, if you had Medicare prior to this year, you will be one of the ones to see that there has actually been a reduction in Medicare Part B premium for the first time ever this year. Okay, so 2022, it was $170.10 a month. Uh, but now in 2023, that has been reduced uh, down to 164.90. So everybody at a 
base level of original Medicare Part B is on the hook for 164.90. Now it can be higher than that depending on your premium. I'm sorry, depending on your income, that premium could be higher depending on income. So what I want to do is I want to I want to go forward a slide real quick and then we'll come back here and finish this up. But I want to explain to you what that means, depending on income. Right. And, and, you know, Melissa and I have had conversations about this in the past, trying to make sure that as folks begin to prepare for this transition to Medicare and, and, and having their 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 financials in order is understanding that your income can have an effect on what your premiums for Medicare will be if you don't have things equipped weighted the right way. So, um, you know, obviously, Melissa and I have worked together to make sure that, you know, she's going to put you in a position to hopefully uh, re reduce, maybe not eliminate, but reduce the the, the higher premium uh, effects of having that income. So let's take a look at that chart really quick. Yeah, so I'm going to stop right there, Mike. Sure, we don't have sure. any questions, so don't forget to, qu to ask questions. Um, but in an example uh, where your financial advisor needs to be aware of your income and how that's going to affect your Medicare premium, I had a client that was two years ago. Um, we updated her financial strategy. We sold a lot of investments in her account, and that created a large capital gain in her accounts. It increased her income and therefore increased her Medicare premiums. Now, I ran an analysis prior to determine, should we make this investment change over two or three years um, and keep her income lower? Was it better to make the investment change now so that we could get into the new investments? Um, and so we ran that analysis, provided that information to the client, so that way they are aware of how these investment changes could change her Medicare premiums prior to it happening. And Mike, I'm sure you're going to go into this, but it, there's a two-year delay. So right. changes that we made two years ago to her portfolio affect her Medicare premiums now. It takes yeah. Medicare a couple of years to see your tax return. Uh, so it'd be her 2021 tax return, That's right? right. Yeah. That is affecting yeah. her 2023 Medicare premiums. Correct. Correct. Oh. And, and, and that can and that can be quite the sticker shock. And I've seen it happen to, to numerous clients of mine when they get the bill from Social Security or from Medicare. And and all of a sudden that premium is a heck of a lot higher than the 164.90 that I that I initially you know uh, talk, talked to them about. So what I want to show you on this chart is exactly what she's talking about here. And this is in, in correlation to what Medicare calls IRMA, an income related month, monthly adjusted amount. OK, and basically what they're doing is they're taking a look back at your modified adjusted gross income from two years prior. So every single year, uh, Medicare is going to reevaluate this premium for you. And again, this chart changes, these numbers change on a yearly basis, but every year, everyone is going to have their individual premium, uh, um, you know, taken a look at and, 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 and redetermined, if you will, right? So for 2023, as Melissa said, they're going to be looking back at that modified adjusted gross income from 2021. So you should be able to find yourself on this chart here. That first, that first column is if you file individually, that second is if you file jointly. Find yourself on that chart from your income tax return from 2021. And then that should give us our answer for our Part B premium plus any IRMA penalty if there is going to be, right? So in 2021, if you filed individually less than 97 thousand or jointly under 194 thousand, then you are going to be at that base rate 164.90. You're not going to have any additional IRMA penalty for either your Part B or your Part D premiums. Okay, but even just that very next level up, right? That very next step up, you can start to see how quickly those monthly premiums, mind you, monthly premiums uh, start to, to start to rise for both your Medicare Part B and on your Part D drug plan. So again, this this piece of the puzzle is just important to understand that it's going to be redetermined on a yearly basis, but it's always going to be determined off of uh, your income tax return from two years prior. And and if you have the time and ability prior to in, uh, being Coming eligible and enrolling in Medicare, and you know we can kind of work with, with, with some of the financials to find a way to, to try to keep this reduction down as much as possible. So now that we understand the Part B premium and what we're going to be paying, the question I often get asked is, well, how am I going to have to pay this, right? How am I going to be am I going to be billed, right? Now, if you are automatically, I'm sorry, if you are already receiving Social Security payments, right? If you're receiving retirement benefits, uh, disability benefits, if you're receiving a monthly income check from Social Security, they're going to make it easy on you. And your, your premium is going to be automatically deducted from that from that check. So there's nothing that needs to be done on your end. You will not be billed. Uh, they'll just automatically deduct it. And you will see that on your statement from Social Security. 
Now, if you are not drawing any benefits when you have Part B, right? I have a lot of folks who start her start Medicare at 65. Uh, maybe, maybe they're not going to start drawing benefits until 68 or, or later, right? Um, those folks are going to receive a bill for their Medicare Part B premiums. Uh, Medicare typically likes to bill this in a quarterly fashion. Uh, so just depending on the time of year in which you begin Medicare, you may see three, I've seen up to five months uh, worth of premiums at once be billed to an individual. Uh, but there are multiple ways to do this. It can be paid online. We can set up an online account and you can pay via credit card or funds transfer or whatever is going to be easiest for you. But um, that's what's going to happen. And that's how you're going to pay the premium. Okay. So the next piece of this is the Part B deductible. Now, keep in mind, when I talk about this deductible, this is when we stay on original Medicare only. OK, and again, this is why we don't want to just stay here, but we're going to but but original Medicare only also carries a deductible. Now, it's a small number. It's only two hundred and twenty six dollars for the for the year. It's a one time annual deductible. But that's not that's not the that's not the tough part. The tough part is once the deductible has been met of two twenty six. Now you hop into the coinsurance or cost share phase with original Medicare. And this is where you have an 80 20 split, 80 percent Medicare, 20 percent you. OK, and again, like we said a, a, a few minutes ago, original Medicare does not have a cap or a max out of pocket. So the 20 percent cost that's coming to you, that's all you that that's every bit uh, on you for, for any of those medical services provided. Um, so, again, this is original Medicare is, is challenging because of the out of pocket exposure with the 20 percent and the endless, uh, in, you know, no cap 20 percent. So that's our that's our biggest fear of original Medicare. And then, like I said, we also have the fact that we're missing drug coverage we're missing things like dental vision and hearing. Um, so we're going to we're going to find a way to fill those in. We're going to find a way to fill that. in. So, so, so Mike, you have yes. said a this is if you're on original Medicare. Yes. Versus, only original. Versus yeah. what? Versus versus the, this slide here. So versus either either adding a Medicare supplement policy to that or a Medicare Advantage plan. So we're going to talk about this first option now. And, and this is what we call a Medicare supplement. Now, this option here, uh, I would say this is the more traditional route of filling in the gaps and holes of, of original Medicare. And, and when I say traditional, I, I literally just mean that it's been around longer. OK, you know, when I when I look at my grandparents, Medicare, uh, you know, this is typically what I see uh, it, it, our our Medicare supplement policy. Uh, Medicare supplements may be not as popular in, in today's day and age, but they, but they were for so many people for so long. And, and here's basically how it works. You're going to keep and retain and use your original Medicare provided by the federal government, right? You're going to use that red, white, and blue Medicare card that's sent to you. You're going to show that to doctors and hospitals when you require services. You're going to have that annual deductible to be met first, and then you're going to hop onto that 80-20 split with Medicare. Now, once you're into that coinsurance phase, 80% is going to get billed to Medicare, and then that 20% that's going to get billed to you, that's where your Medicare supplement or Medigap policy comes into play. OK, so a Medicare supplement or Medigap plan, it's a it's a standalone product that you buy buy from a, a, an insurance company. Um, and that policy, if you get the right one, uh, is going to cover the 20 percent that original Medicare misses. OK, so if 80 percent is being billed to the federal government and the 20 percent is being covered by the Medigap policy, in most cases, again, if you get the right one, but 100 percent of that 20 percent, then folks on Medicare, original Medicare with a Medigap have very, very little to no out of pocket exposure in most cases. Right now. That Medigap policy, it has one job and one job only. And that job is to fill in that 20% coinsurance. So it still doesn't do you anything for your drug coverage. It still doesn't help in the areas of dental vision and hearing. So, you know, I make the joke that when you decide to go with this style of plan, you have to get a new wallet because you're going to have all these different cards to carry. You're going to have your original Medicare card, your Medigap or Medicare supplement card. You're going to have a Part B drug plan card. And if you want to carry dental vision and hearing, then, then there's a, then there's a another card in premium. So this style of plan, it's a little bit more a la carte. Uh, everything is a little bit standalone. And but but quite honestly, when you pair them all together and you do it correctly, this can be a very, very powerful and strong means of, of, of you know, uh, uh, protecting yourself when it comes to Medicare. We're going to dive further into this as, as, as we go on here. But I want to talk about the other style briefly. So the other style of plan that we keep mentioning here is what we call a Medicare Advantage plan. 
Okay. It's also known as part C and here's how they get part C. They take Medicare part A, that hospital insurance. They add your Medicare part B, that medical insurance. They throw in a Medicare part D prescription drug plan all into one policy. And in this scenario, A plus B plus D equals C. So that's how you get to a Medicare Advantage policy is wrapping all three of those components together, uh, as well as a whole slew of extra benefits and things that, that we'll be discussing. But this right here uh, is, is now what I would consider the, the probably leaning towards the more popular option in most cases, not only here in the state of Michigan, but, but we're seeing it across the country now. Uh, more and more folks are, are choosing to go with Medicare Advantage. Now, Medicare Advantage plans, these function a lot like what you are used to through group employer policies that you've had during your working life, right? And the reason that I say that is, is how the plans function, okay? These policies are network-based plans, HMO, PPO style network-based plans, okay? Much like you have through group and employer options. There's gonna be doctors, providers who are accepting and there's gonna be some who are not. And that's what leads us to some Medicare Advantage plans are better than other Medicare Advantage plans because of networks and things like that. But at the baseline, they are a network-based policy. On top of that, these policies are premium, deductible, copay, and max out-of-pocket paced plans. Okay. Now, in most cases, the Medicare Advantage plans that have the value and the popularity that I write every day now are of the $0 premium variety. Okay, and we'll get more into that in a little bit, but, but no premium in most cases. The deductible in most plans, zero. Okay, so you eliminate that Medicare Part B deductible, which means that you jump right in on day one into your copay or cost share phase. Now, the difference in a copay and a copayment, really quickly, a co, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a co insurance and a copayment, a co insurance is a percentage of, right? That's how original Medicare works 80, 20%. When you're dealing with percentages, you're dealing with unknown variable numbers, right? 20% uh, of a little is a little, 20% of a lot is a lot, right? So you, you just don't know what that cost is going to be. Now, when you deal with Medicare Advantage plans in 99% in of the areas on Advantage plans, you are dealing with co-payments or co-pays, okay? These are fixed flat rate dollar amounts contractually agreed upon, right? $10 here, $20 there, $45 there, $110 there, just depending on the service that's provided, right? So you, you pay these fixed flat rate co-pays when you require services. And then last but not least, these plans have what we call a max out of pocket. Right. So unlike original Medicare, these plans actually carry a cap, a limit, a, a threshold to the amount of out of pocket exposure that you could be seeing. Right. So, again, we'll, we'll dive deeper into these in a little bit, but I just want to give you guys an idea and understanding that. On original Medicare, you, you can't just hang out there alone. There's just too many gaps and holes. We're going to fill in those gaps and holes with one of these two options, the, either the more traditional option of Medicare supplement uh, or, or, or Medicare Advantage. So getting into how we just get enrolled into original Medicare, right? Maybe you're not even of that age yet, or maybe you're, you know, you're approaching 65 and you're trying to figure out how do I even get as far as getting my original Medicare card, right? And, and how do I make sure that I set myself up for a seamless transition, okay? And I always talk about my clients like that. I want a seamless transition, right? Meaning I don't want any uninsured days, right? We want insurance to, to terminate on one day with, with, with whether it be uh, an employer coverage or retiree or even things like COBRA uh, or, or individual marketplace plans. And we make that transition to Medicare. We want that thing to start the very next day. So we have no, no, uh, no, no lapses or gaps in coverage. Okay. So there's different enrollment opportunities for different people. Okay, the first I want to talk about really quickly, this is this is not as popular, but it does fit some people, and it's what we call automatic enrollment. So if you are someone that's collecting Social Security benefits early, right, uh, you can start drawing Social Security at 62. Some people choose to start drawing it before Medicare eligibility at 65. So you may be drawing that early. Uh, you may be receiving Social Security disability benefits. Uh, so if you are currently drawing from the Social Security Administration prior to becoming eligible for Medicare, you're just going to be automatically enrolled. Okay, you get to skip the skip the nuance of trying to apply for this thing and going online and doing all that. They're going to automatically enroll you. They're going to send your card to you. Uh, it typically arrives three to four months early, is what I'm used to seeing, uh, is when your Medicare card is going to arrive in the mail. So that for that individual who's already drawing benefits prior to eligibility, automatic enrollment. Now. The one that is more 
popular is what we call your initial enrollment period. And you might have heard of this before. This is the seven month window around your 65th birth month that everybody talks about, right? So it's the, it's the three months before you turn 65, the month you turn 65 and the three months after, okay? Now, what you have to remember about this is a couple of things. Number one, Medicare is always a first of the month effective date. So I get that question all the time. Mike, I'm not, I was not born until the 26th of the month. Well, that's okay. Medicare is still going to begin, begin on the first of that month, okay? Whether you're born on the second or the 31st, it will always be the first of that birth month. Now, the one little trick to that is if you were born on the first of the month, if you have a first of the month birthday, your Medicare would actually take effect the first of the previous month, first of the prior month. So that's the only one little caveat behind that, right? So what does it mean? What does it mean to have a seven month initial enrollment period? What it means is that if you apply for Medicare Part A or B at any point during this seven month period, you will not be penalized for being late. Okay, that's all that it means. It just means that you will not be penalized for being late to enrolling in Medicare if you apply during any of these seven months. What it doesn't mean is that you're going to have this seamless transition that I speak about. OK, the only way to make sure of that happening is that you utilize the first three months of that seven month window. And again, this is if you want Medicare to begin at the very first possible time, which is, that again, that, that first uh, that 65th birth month. And, and I'll show you on this chart what I mean by that. So, Mike, I'm so going to pause you real quick yep, here because yep. I got a couple questions for you sure. too. Or we yep. let's get through this chart and then maybe we can ask yep. those we'll questions. Just, yep, I will get through that chart really quickly. So, what I mean All by right. this is if you utilize those first three months of enrollment to enroll in A and B, you will see that your coverage begins on the first month or the first day of that month you turn 65. But if you wait until that month to enroll, now your coverage is not going to begin until the first of the following month. And as you start to go through this chart, you'll see every month that you enroll in during that seven month period, that effective date gets pushed out further and further and further. So what happens is you're late to the game. You don't sign up until two or three months after your 65th birthday. You're not going to be awarded a penalty because you're still doing it in that seven month period. But now your effective and coverage date doesn't start for a, for a few months out. So what happens is people end up with these gaps and lapses of coverage, right? You lost your coverage when you, when you retired at 65. You didn't sign up right away. And now you don't have Medicare coverage for three, four, five, six months. So again, this just it's just really important to make sure that if you want your Medicare to begin at the very beginning, at the very earliest time that it possibly can, you must utilize those first three months prior. Go ahead, Melissa. All right. So here are some questions that came in. Sure. Well, one thing I'm going to say is when I meet with my clients, I say, hey, go, you know, start considering your Medicare about two to three months out. So when would you yep. say people should really start digging in and researching their options for you Medicare? Know, I, yeah, I, I say it's really never too early to get that ball rolling, right? I, I, I've had multiple conversations with people who are a year or two, three out. They want to have that conversation to know what it's about to occur. But what I tell folks is, literally no later than three months if you can make it happen because dealing with the social security administration uh can be a little bit of a slow process right um and, and i will help you navigate that entire thing taking you all the way through the enrollment process dealing with the federal government the online websites all that fun stuff but the bottom line is they are slow and i and i've seen people that waited too long right they waited within a within a within a handful of weeks before they wanted their effective date and i didn't get it in time Right. And, and, the, and the government didn't get what they needed in time. So it ended up they ended up being late. So my Can rule you of make thumb, your coverage retroactive. At no, all? you cannot. An option? No, okay. no, you cannot. No. Um, so nope. we had a question come in. Uh, this participant says, let's say you're 65 plus um, employee. So yep. you're still working. Right. Which yes. is, I mean, a lot of my yes. clients, as much as we would all love to retire at 65, realistically, sure. yep. they work longer. Okay? Yes. Um, so now you have employer coverage, a large employer, right? Yep. Yep. So you have to choose between your employer coverage or should you enroll for part A? Um, yes. This particular employee gave this information that um, they are on a high deductible healthcare plan. So do you want yep. to go into a little information on that? I sure do. I sure do. So I'm going to, I'm going to go a little bit deep into this, honestly, Melissa, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of pieces of this, right? Mm -hmm. So let, let's, let's, let's start this way. Let's answer that first question. You're 65, you're going to continue to work, right? You're eligible for Medicare now, but you have coverage being provided by an employer. That might be your employer. That might be your spouse's employer. Okay. Either way, the first thing that you have to answer for yourself is, is my coverage creditable? 
And what do I mean by that? So Medicare determines whether or not your coverage that's being offered is credible coverage or not. And the general rule of thumb is if you work for a large employer of more than 20 employees, nine times out of 10, you're going to have credible coverage. But if you work for a small office, a small group employer, uh, they might under, under 20 employees, they, their coverage might not be deemed credible by Medicare. And the only way for you to delay your Medicare effective date, right? If you don't want to start Medicare at 65, you're going to continue to work. The, the only way that works without the risk of penalty is to have credible coverage. So we got to find that out first and foremost. It must how does be an credible. employer do that? Or how does an employee so, do that? What I recommend, so obviously the eye test, right? The 20 employees, you can, you can get a good gauge on that. But, it, but if you want to know for, for sure, go, go to your HR department, go to your benefits coordinator. They should have proof, a printable document to give you that shows that they have credible coverage. Okay. I think you that, actually have to get a disclosure every year, but Lord knows those disclosures they, go straight they, from my mailbox into the trash. Yeah, so. Right, right. Most people miss it. They do send it out. <laughs> they do send it out. But but um, if you want to know for sure, that's the only way to know for sure is to get that, is that get that credible coverage documentation, right? So but then there's another piece to this, right? Just because you know that you have credible coverage, you work for one of these large group employers, the question now becomes, does it make financial sense for me to do this, right? So that example that, that we just got, the question that we got, a high deductible policy, right? We see it all the time. Group and employer policies seem to be getting a little worse and worse every single year, right? And what I mean by worse is the, the premiums are going up, the coverages are getting worse, deductibles are higher, max out of pockets are higher and things like that. So when you compare your creditable group policy, in this case, your high deductible plan versus what Medicare can offer you, that's when you start to figure out pretty quickly which one of these is going to make more sense for you. OK, so I have had both sides of the coin where the individual decides, yep, I'm still going to work for the company, maybe another two, three, four, five years, right, as long as I can, but I'm going to drop my employer coverage, and I'm going to move myself into Medicare because that's what was best for me. It was, it was more beneficial, more cost effective, better benefits to go through Medicare than it was to stick with my employer policy, and in most cases, those employers are happy about that because they are paying a ridiculous amount of money to have you on their plan in most cases, right? If you look at your premium and it's, you know, three, four hundred bucks, just think they're probably paying nine to twelve hundred dollars for, for you right of that portion so they they're, they're not going to be upset that you're leaving their, their their employer policy in most cases but the bottom line is the only way to know for sure is to have a sit down have a conversation with me and let's compare side by side what medicare can offer you those costs those plans those benefits versus what your coverage through your employer is going to cost now, everyone has a different situation, right? And sometimes I've seen it to where someone doesn't really have uh, a choice to be made, right? And here's what often happens. The older spouse in the relationship turns 65 and wants to jump off onto Medicare. The younger spouse is using the older spouse's group policy to have their coverage. So if the older spouse drops their group covers to go to Medicare, they leave the younger spouse on the curb with no insurance. Right. So I've seen it a thousand times to where people are, quote unquote, forced to work a little longer or to carry their group insurance just to keep the younger spouse insured without having to go and utilize the marketplace or any other numerous insurance options on an individual basis, uh, which which sometimes can be more costly than, than group insurance. It all depends on income. But anyway, there's just a lot of different scenarios when it comes to somebody making a decision on whether or not they're going to delay Medicare or not. So can we talk about, because this example, the employee is on a high deductible plan. Yes, and yes. Most likely if you're on a high deductible plan, you have a health savings account that you're contributing yep. to. Yes, so yes. So can we talk about, you know, applying for, you know, I'm covered under my employer's insurance right now. I've decided yep. to stay on that plan. Yep. Should I apply for Medicare Part A too? Perfect, perfect. That's a, yep, that's free? a great question. So considering that it's free, in most cases, you are going to want to apply for, for Part A. With one, with one caveat, okay? As soon as you start collecting social security benefits, whether it be retirement benefits, Medicare benefits, you are no longer eligible to contribute to a health savings account of your own, 
You can no longer contribute to an HSA. So if your policy that you've chosen to remain on, even albeit that it's a high deductible policy, you have a good amount in your HSA, you like contributing to that fund, you want to stick with that, do not sign up for Medicare Part A or else you will stop your ability to continue to contribute. So that's oh. the one thing. If you're, if you're going to stay with group coverage and it's not an HSA, by all means, sign up for Part A. It gets you in the system. It gets you a Medicare number. Uh, you, you know, you're well on your way to transitioning later on. But if you have an HSA, you cannot sign up for Part A. So what I'm hearing from you is if you apply for Social Security, they automatically yep. sign you up for Part A. So you would not be eligible to contribute to your HSA. Th that, is, that is correct. But either and, one, either one. It's, yep. Or maybe you're not getting Social Security, but if you apply for Part A, yep. you're not going to be eligible to contribute to your HSA. That is correct. And that then is correct. the last piece of it that kind of gets people to is when you do go to apply for Medicare, let's say you're 67 years old and you apply for Medicare because you delayed it. Yep. Um, it's my understanding you have to stop contributing to your HSA six months prior yeah, to yep. uh, your Medicare insurance happening. Yeah. And this yep. is, so, these, this is yeah. why I have a job, quite frankly, because how are we <laughs> supposed to remember all these rules? Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's crazy. And there's, there's a lot of little nuances and I've seen people get caught up in every one of them. It's just, it's just, if you don't know about it, you, it's, it's easy to make the mistake. So what you're referring to there, Melissa, is if you've chosen to delay Medicare, to continue that group coverage, right? And you are you are paying into an HSA. Whether you make that transition to Medicare two years from now, four or five years from now, they want you to stop your contribution to your HSA six months prior to that transition to Medicare. If not, I have seen there be some tax implications with that fact um, when you make that transition over, uh, just due to the fact that those HSA are, are tax deferred funds. Um, and so obviously there, there can be some, there's some, some tax implications, if you will, that, that can come into that. So if you're, if you're transitioning out of an HSA to Medicare at 65 and you're not going to delay, you don't have to stop early contribution. You would have to stop that contribution six months. If you, if you are choosing to delay Medicare and sign up at a later time. Real quick here, I do see that there's a participant, Julie, that has her hand raised. Sure. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute her real quick to see if she can ask her question. You know, maybe she's watching from a cell phone or something like that. Typing in a question is not easy. So, Julie, I have unmuted you. If you want to hold on, we're gonna ask to unmute. If you want to ask your question verbally, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like that's gonna work out. So, um. Go ahead and type that question in if you, oh, yeah, there you are. Julie, can you hear us? Yes, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I was trying to find that location. Um, I had heard that the um, Congress or Senate, there was um, a bill in there, I'm not quite sure where it is, as far as um, voiding the six month um, uh, limit. Con the know, contribution, maybe. yep, yep. Yeah, the contribution. Yep. Have you heard anything about that? As far as so, there, there's there's been a lot coming from from Congress is in regards to Medicare lately. Uh, a lot of it is due to the uh, Medicare prescription drug changes that are coming in 2025. That's that's the big one that I have my eye on. Uh, I have heard little uh, grumblings about what you're talking about uh, with the six month. I, I, I want to be honest with you. I don't know enough about that at this point to, to speak on that, uh, whether or not they're going to be changing any of that or not. What I can say is, is I, I've had people in the past who made their transition to, you know, out of that HSA, you know, into Medicare at a later date, they did not stop contributing at that six month mark, they weren't aware of it. Uh, you know, I, I tried to follow up with them and find out if they ever really saw any kind of implications from that. And, and it didn't seem like they had. So it, it's one of those things that like, it's a rule, it's documented, it's out there, it's talked about. But I, I, in my career of doing this, I have yet to really see it um, be, become a true issue for anyone. Couple but, things but I, on that. You're all, it's yeah. only going to get caught if you get audited, right? Because that's okay. going to go on your tax return. So it would get caught if you're audited by the I IRS. See. And if you do find out that you did this, there is a way to back out of that contribution. So you can usually work with your HSA provider to I get see. those funds back um, when you file your okay. tax return. So just well, that's that. there is yeah. a corrective process along the way for that. So that's probably why Absolutely. I haven't seen. All right, yeah, Mike, we'll keep you going, OK? Yeah, yeah, no, no worries. So so basically the idea of this here, this this slide is in, in relation to that delaying of Medicare. Right. So if you delay that that 
um, that Medicare start date because you have that continuation of credible group coverage. And we've decided that it's actually more beneficial for you to remain there than it is to, to make that move to Medicare. Um, when you make that switch over, you are going to have an eight month period or window to get this done. I, again, that eight months just, I mean, it, it just means that you won't be penalized for applying anytime during that eight months, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna be set up for that seamless transition with no, with no lapses in coverage. So uh, we do wanna make sure that if that's the idea for you um, and that you're gonna be working past 65 and starting Medicare at a later date, that we set up for that seamless transition two, three months, three, four months, hopefully in advance if you know about that, that loss of coverage coming so that we can properly take the avenues to gather the proof of credible coverage documentation, submit those to, to Medicare and apply for A and B. So um, those are really the three different enrollments that I wanted to talk about. So what I wanna get into now, like I said, a little bit of a change in, in, in pace, but let's let's get into the different plans here. So we're gonna talk about drug coverage, those Medigap plans and those Medicare Advantage. Um, I am not doing good on time at all, am I, Melissa? <laughs> no, okay. Uh, we will we will try to speed it up. If we gotta if we gotta end it, we gotta end it. But uh, I'll try to speed it up here. So when it comes to Medicare Part D drug plans, they are offered to anybody with Medicare. Okay, Part D drug plans are always uh, through privatized insurance companies. The federal government does not deal with them. They are all offered by private insurance companies. Uh, and as I said earlier, unfortunately, when it comes to Medicare Part B and Part D in this case, um, there can be penalties associated with not signing up for these when you're first supposed to, okay? So again, we wanna make sure that we avoid penalties. When it comes to Medicare, unfortunately, penalties last a lifetime. So even though I put a stop to those penalties uh, uh, for those clients last week, um, that penalty will now live with them for, for remainder of life, unfortunately. Um, now there's two different ways to get your prescription drug coverage, right? One of them is gonna be that in that standalone a la carte drug policy, uh, you would use this in conjunction with uh, your, your original Medicare and that Medicare supplement plan. The other way that you're going to get your Part D drug coverage is going to be provided through that Medicare Advantage, right? That Part C plan that includes the A, B, and D portion. So those are your two different ways of getting that. Now, this is kind of a, a crazy thing, and I'm not, I don't want to dive too far into this right now just, just with time, but what I want everybody to understand is as of today, until changes come hopefully in 2025, there are, there are coverage phases in these Part D drug plans, okay? And, and regardless of how you get your drug plan, whether it be standalone or through your Advantage plan, they all follow these same four phases. And those phases include the deductible phase, the initial coverage phase, uh, the coverage gap, better known as the donut hole. I'm sure everybody's probably heard of the, maybe a heard of the donut hole before, uh, and then the catastrophic phase. And really what this equates to is what your out-of-pocket exposure is going to be when it comes to your Part D drug plan. Uh, and you'd be, you'd be surprised how uh, you know, how many times just changing a drug plan from one year to the next for an individual um, can keep people out of the donut hole or reduce their costs dramatically um, just by making sure that they are in the correct drug plan for them for that year. Um, so again, like I said, there's a lot of different nuances here. Uh, I, I would be happy to go deeper into this uh, at, at a later time, but again, I don't want to. I don't want to waste up all your time on this. So. When it comes to these drug policies, every drug plan has a drug formulary or a, the list of medications, if you will, that that drug company covers, okay? Now, the interesting thing about this is formularies are different and they, and they are individualized based on the carrier, on the company. So not everybody's drug formulary is the same. And on that list of medications, next to the name of the medication that's covered, there's typically a little number there. And that number is gonna equate to the tier level in which that medication is covered. Uh, as you can see here by the, by, the, by the graphic, your tier one and tier two medications, these are your generics, right? These are your run-of-the-mill generics. Uh, you know, the common ones I see, atorvastatin, lisinopril, uh, omeprazole, you know, those, those are the ones I see on a daily basis. Those are generics and those are, those are tier one and tier two typically, uh, which are going to equate to a very low cost copay for those, um, sometimes as low as zero dollars, depending on the plan. So very low cost for tier one and two. Tier three, four, and five. Unfortunately, these are going to be your preferred uh, brand name medications or specialty medications. Um, obviously, when you start dealing with three, fours, and five, the costs go up dramatically. Um, you know, I always get the question, "How do I know if I have a three, four, or five? Uh, You know, and, and the and the quick answer is, if you take a medication that has a TV commercial for it, um, then there's probably a good chance that that's going to be a, a a brand name medication or specialty med, and, and it's likely going to equate to a tier three, four, or five, um, and that's where we start to see 
see the cost get get pretty high for some folks and the donut hole become a reality. So the bottom line is the moral of the story when we're talking about drug coverage is it's very important to make sure that every single year you have the right Part D drug plan for yourself and for your list of medications. You get a yearly opportunity to change that prescription drug plan. So you're never tied into one for any longer than a year. Uh, and, and, and I will help you navigate that entire piece of the drug plan. Um, you know, you know, listing every medication, the tier, the copay cost, where I prefer that you fill it. Um, you know, what pharmacy, 90 days, mail order, you name it. We're gonna, we're gonna put out a game plan together to figure out the lowest cost way to fill your medications for that year. Okay. I and like I said, clients, just like you have open enrollment for your employer's health care plan, there's open enrollment for Medicare every year. And you should shop your Medicare plans, I think, every year, just like you every would. Year when you're reviewing your employer's new healthcare coverage every year. Correct. Uh, it correct. doesn't hurt to reach out to your agent and be like, hey, I'm on this new prescription drug or hey, we're thinking about traveling more. You know, whatever it might be might change your circumstances and that might change the proper Medicare plan for you. For sure. The, the thing that I see the biggest with that, Melissa, is the fact that on one drug plan, your medication might be a tier three. On the next drug plan over, that same medication might be a tier one or two. Uh, and that ends up changing costs dramatically. I mean, by the hundreds, if not thousands of dollars over the course of a year for someone. So it, it's really important. It really is. So what I want to do now, let's start moving into really quickly here, the idea of Medicare supplement and Medicare Advantage plan. So let's talk about Medicare supplement first. Again, uh, this is that traditional route. You keep that original A and B of Medicare and you add in that Medigap or supplement policy on top of that. Okay. Now, the idea of a Medigap policy, it's, it's like you said before, it's an additional coverage that you purchase through a private insurance company. And that plan has one job only. And it's to fill in that 20% gap or coinsurance that original Medicare has. Okay. Um, now, when it comes to Medigap policies, a couple things to keep in mind. They are not the cheapest thing on the planet by any means. Okay. There's a monthly premium that's associated with a Medigap policy. Okay. And those premiums are going to be dependent on a lot of different factors, your age, your gender, your location, the county in which you reside, the region in which you reside are all going to have a factor on what your premium cost is going to be. And that's going to vary between carrier to carrier, company to company. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different factors that come into play when it, when it comes to the premium associated, but what you have to understand is this, every single year, you are going to see an increase to your Medigap premium. Okay, there are rate increases with Medigap plans, and those rate increases happen in numerous facets. Uh, you know, the easy one is attained age. Every year that you age, the insurance company views you as a larger risk than the year before, uh, and so you're going to probably see a rate increase with that. Um, you may also see rate increases for numerous other reasons. Um, you know, these insurance companies have a lot of actuarials and things that are figured out on, on to where the rate increases are going to go and to who, um, and, and those can be ba based on, again, where you reside. For example, you know, a 65 year old male on a Medigap plan G in Kent County uh, is probably going to be a lot cheaper than that same 65 male in that same plan G, but in Wayne or Oakland County in Detroit area. Uh, it, it's just based on population. It's based on overall health. It's based on things like that. So a lot of different, a lot of differences when it comes to that. Now, what's not different about Medigap policies is that Medigap policies are standardized. Plans are standardized, which means that the difference between two companies when it comes to the plan at a basic level, there isn't one. A Medigap G is a Medigap G is a Medigap G. Whether you get it with carrier A, B, or C, uh, the Medigap G is going to cover the same thing across the board. Now, some of these policies or plans might throw in some extras and things to entice you to come their way, uh, but, but at a basic level, a G is a G, an N is an N, you know, so that, that's, that's what keeps them standardized between companies. So the and biggest my difference is, is that anyone that accepts Medicare has to accept these supplemental policies. That, that's right. right. That's right. If, if the doc, that's yes, right. If the doctor, the Medigap provider, policy. Yep. If the doctor provider is accepting and billing original Medicare, then your Medigap plan G is going to come in there and take care of that remaining 20%. So here's here's one thing that we that we have to understand. Medigap policies. There's a bunch of different plans. Okay, um, you know we I call them alphabet plans because there's there's a bunch of them. J, K, and L, and A, and C, and F, and G, and N. There's there's a bunch of different ones, right? 
there's really only two in today's day and age that really have the value in them that I see. And that's going to be a Medigap plan G number one and a Medigap plan N number two. And, and here's the idea. A Medigap plan G is going to be the most comprehensive coverage available for Medigap at this point in time. Now, there may be some of you in here who have Medigap policies from, from the past, and you might be dealing with a plan C or an F. Um, the C and the F had some changes recently. They are now closed. Um, no new people are being entered into CNF, and that's where GNN came from. They're the new, the GNN of a new CNF, right? So um, the idea behind GNN is pretty self-explanatory. The Plan G is going to cover 100% of the 20% that Medicare misses minus the deductible. So you still have to pay that Part B deductible to get yourself on that 80-20 split. But once you get yourself there, that Medigap Plan G is going to come in and pay that remaining 20% that original Medicare missed. Okay, uh, It even covers what we call excess charges. So in the state of Michigan, doctors and hospitals are allowed to charge an excess of up to 15% more than the original Medicare approves. Okay, So if the doctor decides to charge more than that original Medicare cost fee schedule, then the Medigap G is going to also cover that for you. So when I deal with clients of mine or, or that I come across that have Medigap plan G's, C's, F's, you know, of that nature, you know, these people have very, very little to no out-of-pocket exposure when it comes to, to doctors, hospital stays, procedures, and things like that. So obviously that's very, very good, right? But again, you're, you're, you know, you have to pay the monthly premium to have that plan. That is on top of the Part B premium that you're already paying to the, to the federal government. Uh, you know, the rate increases on a yearly basis. The fact that you still have to add drug coverage and dental vision and hearing. So it's a, it's a very, very strong policy and way to go, but it can also be very expensive for some. And what I'm seeing now, and I actually just did it yesterday for a gentleman, uh, he's had his Medigap policy for five years now, and the, and the premiums have absolutely skyrocketed from where he started. Uh, and so we actually just got rid of the Medigap policy and moved him to Medicare Advantage, and he's, he's really excited about that, that change. So uh, that's Mike, what I'm going to pause you seeing. real quick yeah, before we yeah. talk about Medicare Advantage, because we are yes. at the one o'clock hour. Yes. And I know, Mike, you probably need maybe 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. I'll get through it. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and so we want to be cognizant of everybody's time and remind you that if you have to get off today's call, um, this will be recorded. We're also going to send you follow-up information, a follow-up email with um, some additional information on Medicare, a white paper on Medicare, as well as our contact information. So, um, you know, don't forget to sign up for the rest of the sessions. I know Susan's going to say that here in a moment, too, at the end of the session. Uh, we have good ones coming up on Social Security, um, estate planning for retirement. So just want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Sorry that we're running over today, okay? Yeah, I apologize. Like I said, when I get going on Medicare, it's hard to slow me down. So I'm sorry <laughs> about that. If you, if you want to stick around, I, I would appreciate it. I just have a few more minutes I'd like to go through here. So switching, uh, one more thing that I really need to make mention about Medigap, and this is probably the most important thing that everybody needs to understand about Medigap. And this is the thing that I probably see the most people not understanding correctly about Medigap policies, okay? And it comes to your ability and eligibility to enroll into one of these plans, okay? The bottom line is this, everybody has a Medigap open enrollment period. And that open enrollment period is, is, is literally just a six month window, a six month window of time. And that starts on your Part B effective date. So the regardless of when you started Medicare Part B, whether you picked it up at 65 or maybe you delayed it to 68 because you kept working, uh, whenever Part B goes into effect, that's what triggers your timer in your six month Medigap open enrollment period. Now, what's so nice about that period is that you are guaranteed issue, guaranteed acceptance during that period. There, are, there is no medical underwriting whatsoever. So during that period of time, we choose the Medigap plan that we want with the carrier that we want. And by the time that we submit the application, we are going to be guaranteed accepted in that policy at that standard rate uh, because of the fact that you are in that six-month guaranteed issue period. So why is that important? For individuals who are beginning Medicare who know they have some health conditions, some health concerns, um, they know they're going to get the value out of their Medigap plan, uh, and, and maybe they're dealing with some pretty extraordinary medical circumstances, this period of time, this six-month period might literally be the only time for the rest of your life that you're going to be able to get one of these Medigap plans if that's a style of plan that fits you and fits your budget and fits your needs. 
once that six month period expires and you're outside of your first six months of Medicare Part B, and now you want to sign up for a Medigap policy, or you just want to switch Medigap plans from one company that you've already had to another, and you're outside of that first six months, now your guarantee of acceptance is no longer. Now you have to go through medical underwriting. Now you have to answer health questions. Now the, now the insurance company has their, your fate in their hands on uh, whether or not they're going to accept you or not. And they're gonna look at medical records and they're gonna do a pretty good job of figuring out the, the risk associated with you uh, on whether or not you're gonna be accepted by that plan. And, and, uh, and oftentimes, unfortunately, I see denials, right? I see denials of people not being able to get these plans due to current health conditions or, or they get rated, right? And all of a sudden their premium is $450 a month as opposed to the 180 that it should be because they're they have health risks so bottom line is if you want medigap six months guaranteed to begin with no guarantee outside of that first six months very very important to understand so switching gears really quickly now to Medicare Advantage, like we talked about, network-based policies, uh, private insurance companies that run these plans. So when you're dealing with a Medicare Advantage plan, you are no longer dealing with the federal government and original A and B. You're no longer dealing with the deductible. You're no longer dealing with the 80-20 split. Uh, you're not even using that original red, white, and blue Medicare card anymore. You are dealing strictly with the private insurance company, and they're dealing with Medicare in the background. So you have your, your, your nice plastic uh, uh, you know, ID card here. Uh, you have a network of providers and doctors that you that are accepted by the plan. Um, you, you have your Part D coverage. You have you have things like uh, dental, vision, and hearing built into it. Um, things like gym memberships and over-the-counter allowances, and just a whole slew of extra benefits that are built into these plans. Now, what a lot of people ask is, is this still Medicare? It's still a part of the Medicare system for sure. It's a, it's a part of the Medicare program, but it's being provided by private insurance companies approved by Medicare. So every one of these Advantage plans has to be approved by Medicare. It gets a star rating system by Medicare. Uh, you know, And there are a lot of different things that rate a Medicare Advantage plan over one another. So the very first thing I will tell you is not all Medicare Advantage plans are the same. It is not a one size fits all product by any means. When, when, it, when I deal with enrolling people in Medicare Advantage, Advantage, which is, you know, eight, nine, ten, ten times, eight, nine times out of 10 when I deal with folks is, is Medicare Advantage plans. We are checking your medications. We are checking your doctors to fit the network. We are making sure that you have an understanding of how the plans function, where your costs are going to be affiliated, associated from. It's very important to go through each and every step of those. Like I said, a lot of these plans are very enticing. You see the commercial zero dollar cope, you know, zero dollar premium, zero dollar this and that. A lot of them are zero dollar premium and there's a lot of value there. A lot of them are zero dollar deductible and there's a lot of value there, but it's understanding that you are now gonna have co-pays for services that you receive. It's a pay as you go method, but you do have that max out of pocket there to back you up, right? And I wanted like, to go into this. I wanted to understand yeah. this because it's like, how is this different? Why does this happen? Why, are, yep. why is there Medigap versus why is there Advantage plans? So yep. the government is basically running the Medigap plans, what is covered mm -hmm. under G, what is covered under N, and then they just pay the insurance company to do the administration, mm -hmm. right? And yep. so the insurance company changes their premiums based on administration. Government says how much they're going to pay for services and the, you know, other health insurance companies out there, they just administer it, yep. right? With the Medicare Advantage plans, the government says, okay, health insurance company, you take care of it. Yeah. Uh, Jane Smith is now your problem. Yep. Um, here's X amount of money each month. Yep. And then the health insurance company decides what providers are going to give you, what extra benefits are going to give you, if they're going to give you vision or dental or whatever, maybe a gym membership. We've seen mm -hmm. that in the area. So the healthcare company is now running the plan and deciding what they're going to cover and what they're not going to cover. Um, so that's kind of the main difference is they're, the government's basically offloading their responsibility and saying, you get X amount of money for Jane Smith. Now you take care of her health insurance needs. Yep. And, and that, and that is correct, but there's, but there's some advantage or some benefits to that too, right? Because mm -hmm. now if the, if the, if the private insurance company is the one that's in charge of that, they only have so much money per person, the way that they make profit is to keep as much money of that in their pockets as possible. Right. So their goal 
just like your goal of a Medicare Advantage member is health and longevity. The healthier that you are, for the longer you are, the better your costs are gonna be and your health is gonna be, it's also gonna save them money. So when you do a Medicare Advantage plan, what I love about it is the services that people get from their carrier, their company, because they are playing out of the same dugout, if you will, right? They are playing on the same team. Your health, your longevity is your best interest. It's their best interest. They wanna see you doing the preventative and routine they want to see you using the dental vision, hearing the drug benefits, the over-the-counter, the gym membership. They want to see those things because that's going to help lo with, with longevity and health, right? And so Medicare Advantage plans were specifically designed and they work best for your preventative and proactive folk, right? People who are just not on top of their health care and, and they wait to do this and they skip on this and they skip on that uh, and, and, they're, and they're always doing they're always doing, uh, you know, after, uh, you know, not preventative maintenance. They're doing, they're doing healthcare after the fact, not preventative. Those people end up getting nickel and dime pretty good on Medicare Advantage plans because of the fact that they weren't on top of their health as best as possible. So again, we're talking about two different styles of plans. Um, there is no right or wrong. There really is no right or wrong. Uh, I think, you know, with every scenario that I've ever had. When you, whether you choose Medicare Advantage or Medicare Supplement, you're going to be very, very happy with what you have. It's just a difference in understanding where your costs are associated, when you're going to pay those, and how the plans are going to function, what coverages and benefits you have and don't have. Uh, but, but there definitely is no right or wrong. It's not a one-size-fits-all product by any means. Um, so uh, one, one last thing, and I, I'll wrap this thing up, I promise here. So uh, just a quick, quick comparison between Medicare supplement and Medicare Advantage plans. Again, when it comes to doctors and hospitals, the Medicare supplement, very nice and friendly. There are no networks. You show up where you want, when you want to see who you want. Medicare Advantage, on the other hand, it is network-based. But with the carriers that I represent, the ones that I use here in West Michigan, the strong ones in the, in the area, very, very, very large, expansive, and strong networks to where the network issue for most people ends up kind of becoming a moot point. A lot of them have awesome out of state travel benefits and things like that as well. So the, the, the network aspect is, is, is not as uh, big of a deal as it once was. Referrals. Most of these Medicare Advantage plans do not require referrals to see specialists. I know that it says you may need it, but a lot of them do not require the referral to see specialists. Um, same as the Medicare supplement. You're not going to need, need to worry about that. Um, enrollment. Enrollment. Like I said, Medigap, Medicare supplement. You get that first six months of guaranteed and outside of that first six months, you're not guaranteed. You have to apply through underwriting and you may or may not be accepted. The nice thing about Medicare Advantage and the reason why I was able to move this gentleman just the other day off of Medigap onto Advantage, Medicare Advantage does not have any underwriting requirements. They, they're always a guarantee of acceptance. Um, there are different enrollment periods throughout the year that allow somebody to enroll in those, but you're never gonna be denied from a Medicare Advantage plan due to health conditions or concerns. When it comes to costs, right? The Medigap, ever, well, actually both of them, Medigap and Medicare Advantage. It's always on top of that Part B premium, right? Again, Part B is the ticket to the dance. These are additional, right? So it's always in, in addition. But the Medigap, you're going to pay a monthly premium uh, and those premiums are going to rise on a yearly basis due to, due to rate increases. But you're going to have very little out-of-pocket exposure once you have services. Whereas on the other hand, Medicare Advantage, nothing upfront as a monthly premium. So you have a very healthy year, right? Very little to no services. Guess what? Very little to no out-of-pocket costs. You have an unhealthy year and you spend a week in the hospital and you have X, Y, and Z. Now you're going to have some out-of-pocket exposure and co-pays for those, right? So again, it's just a difference in cost. Is it pay now or pay later? Uh, and then prescription drug coverage, not, last but not least, Medicare supplement does not have Medicare uh, drug coverage built in. You have to add that a la carte, standalone. That's what the Part D drug plan is for. Whereas Medicare Advantage, that Part D drug plan is going to be built right into it for you. So it's all, it's all under one roof. Um, so I'll, I'll skip on this trial rate stuff. This is, this is like Medicare 201. We can talk about that at, at, a, at a later date and time. Um, but, but the last thing I want to make mention of here real quick, I'm an independent agent. Whether you work with me or you work with somebody else local in the area, I urge you to utilize independent agents. And the reason that is, is because independents are not only licensed by the state of Michigan and life and health insurance, but we are contracted directly with multiple insurance carriers in our area to represent these plans, both local regional players and large national players, right? The idea is that we are not financially incentivized whatsoever to write a particular plan. Uh, the Centers for Medicare Services sets our, our, our commissions that we 
we earn. Um, so we don't have any reason to put you with one carrier company over the other for any financial incentive. The incentive is to make sure that you are in the right plan for you and that you are going to be satisfied and stick with me and, and, and as long as as long as we can, right? You do not pay Medicare insurance agents. And I get that question all the time. Mike, what do I owe you? How do I do this? What do, what do you charge? Nothing. Nothing. None of the consultations, none of the appointments, none of the phone conversations, the emails today, tomorrow, five, 10 years from now, you will never pay me. Independent agents get paid a commission by the carrier when we write business for you, right? Think of it as a finder's fee, right? They are paying me a commission for bringing you to them. So you do not pay me for your services, okay? And very lastly, but not least, I promise you, I just want to make sure that people understand again, every single fall, October 15th, December 7th, eight weeks a year, that is the annual enrollment period for Medicare that allows Medicare changes to Medicare Advantage plans and to Part D drug plans, okay? So if you are enrolled in a Medicare Advantage or a Part D drug plan, we can make a change to your policy during October 15th to December 7th. And then, and then the last thing here is special enrollment periods, okay? Like I said before, there are different things that populate throughout a year that, al that allow somebody to make a change in the middle of the year, okay? And one of the big ones this year, especially in West Michigan, is the special enrollment period for five-star plans. So five-star rated plans are very, very rare. Uh, we have, Michigan actually only had their first five-star plan last year, and we're on the second year of that now. Five-star plans are very rare, but what they allow you to do is if you are not enrolled in a five-star advantage plan, so you could be on original Medicare only. You could be on original Medicare with a Medigap. You could be in a different Advantage plan that's not five-star rated, but they will allow you to enroll into that specific five-star plan at any time during the year. So that's a huge enrollment period for us this year. Uh, it essentially allows me to write Medicare for you every day all throughout the year because of that. Um, other things like Medicaid status, if you've had a change in Medicaid status or continuation of Medicare, that's a special enrollment period. Um, you moving in and out of plan areas, that's a special enrollment period. Um, so the bottom line is, I can help you find a way to make changes for you when, when we need to. Um, so I just recommend that if you have any further questions uh, about this stuff, um, I, I urge you to reach out to me, give me a call, shoot me an email. Um, I'd be more than happy to discuss your individual needs with you, um, you know, going over, uh, you know, your individual Medicare journey. Because again, it's, it's different for everyone uh, and, and I'd be happy to help you out. So thank you again. Uh, sorry for going over. I apologize. Uh, like I said, like I could probably go another hour or two, but I won't. I won't do it to you. Uh, but again, thank you all. Thank you. And thank Thanks, you, Mike. That was really good. <laughs> and Melissa, Not it's wonderful problem. information. Um, as Melissa suggested, uh, there'll be follow-up information. I'll include um, for those of you that registered, which will include a link to the recording of this um, session, as well as a white paper with additional information, Mike and Melissa's contact information, if you have questions or need anything further, um, and that way you can reach out to Mike directly um, with additional questions. So. Appreciate you all being here. I will also send some additional information about other programming outside of the Retire Well series that we have aimed at our legacy and um, 55 and older alums and community members uh, and how to expand those. So if there are programs that you want to see in future, please don't uh, be shy and let us know. So thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That's recording.